So our first speaker will be Arminder Deal. Um, she's an epidemiologist and mathematical modeler uh, by background uh, with several years of field experience in sub-Saharan Africa, China, and India. Uh, she's currently head of data science uh, and advanced analytics at CEPI, uh, which is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, and was previously faculty at Imperial College. Uh, she's going to speak about GS Learn, which is the Global South Leaders in Epidemic Analytics and Response Network, uh, which I'm proud to say we have partnered with Arminder uh, and her team on, on developing. Uh, the next speaker will be Britta Lassman, uh, who's a physician trained in infectious diseases uh, and who works at the intersection of clinical care, public health, analytics, and technology. Uh, she co-founded a new program, um, which we'll hear about today, called Beacon, or Biothreats, Emergence, Analytics, and Communications Network. Uh, Beacon endeavors to collect, vet, analyze, and report on emerging threats to humans, animals, plants, and the environment, and builds upon uh, programs that you've uh, likely used or heard of in the past, uh, such as ProMed Mail and HealthMap, and while leveraging the uh, many new developments in machine learning and AI, uh, like, like many of us are thinking about. And then finally, Justin Lessler, uh, who's in the room, our only speaker uh, in person in real life, uh, is an epidemiologist and professor at the UNC Gilling School of Public Health, where he studies infectious disease dynamics at the intersection of research and policy. Uh, he also co-founded the Scenario Modeling Hub for SARS-CoV-2, uh, the extension of which he'll speak about today. Uh, Justin's published extensively on, on influenza, cholera, and SARS-CoV-2. So with that introduction, um, I'll turn it over to Arminder to give the first talk. And Arminder, can you hear us? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, great. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Thank you, David. So I was just trying to multitask by allowing Bo to be the captioner. So if someone else hosting could do that, that'd be great because I'm uh, a bit useless there. So hi, everyone. So as David mentioned, this is a joint venture between CEPI and um, the Bill and Gates Foundation. And we're working with David and his team to carry out this initiative. And we're very excited about it. So this is a Global South Leaders in Epidemic Analytics and Response Network. Um, can I change the um, slides myself? Uh, so, OK. Can you? Yes. So um, before going into the network, uh, let us uh, let me discuss and mention what the gap is currently and what is needed. And some of you in the audience, or maybe everyone may already know, so apologies in advance. So um, uh, next slide, please. So why is modeling important? Um, sorry, this is going to be an animation, David. So carry on, next slide. So firstly, it can be used as a sandbox uh, to test the effects of um, of different drugs, dosing schedules, and treatment methods on diseases. Next slide, uh, next bit, please. And, or we can learn more about the disease and condition being investigated. Next bit. It can also be used to uh, forecast the um, the effects of non-pharmaceutical interventions, for example, or other, other aspects such as weather. Next slide. And it can also reduce uh, costs. So looking at what what sort of interventions, what scenarios reduce costs and time? Next slide. And also help identify knowledge gaps. And for example, where, um, where, other, where other investigations need to be conducted. Uh, and it's a systematic way to expose what is known. And last bit. And it can also be used to assess the impact of the disease and the interventions, such as the number of deaths caused or hospitalizations or economic costs averted with the, with the vaccine, for example. So it's an essential tool for um, that can be used to for evidence-based policy making. Next slide, please. So COVID-19 uh, raised global awareness of disease modeling amongst policymakers and the general public, but it also highlighted the substantial differences in capacity to conduct disease modeling between countries, and, and particularly well, the apparent lack of uh, or presence of such individuals' expertise in LMICs to conduct these activities and provide timely modeling evidence. And we know that low and middle income countries face several challenges in computational skills and modeling. That's not just capacity itself, but also the infrastructure as well to carry out these computational methods. And we also know that uh, LMICs face a disproportionately high infectious disease burden. Next slide, please. So the aim of GS Learn is to develop leaders in epidemic analytics and response in the Global South 
By strengthening and leveraging technical expertise and knowledge in infectious disease modeling and enhancing interdisciplinary collaborations between and within uh, across regions by creating and fostering partnerships. Next slide, please. So what is, oh, sorry, one slide back, thank you. So what is needed? So one, we need to fill the gap in technical expertise in the global south in infectious disease modeling. So we know most global leaders in epidemic and infectious disease modeling are in high income countries, yet many high risk pathogens originate or affect settings in the global south. So we need more context driven modelers uh, and models that are that can be provide um, fast and efficient epidemic responses and that can inform policy. Secondly, we need to create and foster global south leaders through key partnerships. Modeling institutions often work with silo and they aren't often working with key partners in endemic regions. So we need to facilitate matchmaking. This is to connect partners between south to south and north to south regions and ensure diverse geographic representation and expertise. And we also need to ensure that uh, we can establish and sustain long term partnerships. This is through working together on projects and leveraging each other's uh, strengths and experiences. Next slide, please. So I'll now go into the GS Learn objectives. Next slide, please. But before doing that, I'll um, highlight some of the CEPI objectives that we have. So I don't know if many of you know CEPI, but we have three prior, like three, three key aims amongst other things. So one is the 100 days mission. And this is the aspiration for the world to be able to respond to the next disease X with a new vaccine in just 100 days. We also have a focus on the global south, and this is to strengthen global outbreak preparedness and response capacity and capabilities in the global south. And this is through establishing and coordinating um, key relationships with partners to fill these gaps. And lastly, equitable access lies at the heart of our mission. And so this is um, ensuring that we have improved collective knowledge base in LMICs to speed up uh, diversification and access to interventions for all. And this is through knowledge sharing and investments in human capacity strengthening. Next slide, please. So how the Learn GS Learn Initiative objectives feed into these, uh, these uh, CEPI objectives. Firstly, the 100 days mission, it falls under that in terms of connecting resources and capacities to spread best practices in these regions. It also fosters ongoing partnership with these key um, facilitators, and we'll, I'll go into that later, but we have key representatives from each region um, uh, representing this um, initiative. And also building regional expertise to optimize capacity for quicker and efficient epidemic response through rapid data analysis and modeling. Under the equitable access framework, we, we would like to connect South to South and South to global um, partners to enhance and expand global collaboration and also connect institutions with complementary expertise and resources. And this is ensuring diverse geographic representation and expertise. And lastly, enable the global South to prepare for epidemic and pandemics by responding um, swiftly through strengthening and leveraging capacity and capabilities in infectious disease modeling and computational skills. Next slide, please. So the GS Learn key objectives are one, to build, strengthen, or leverage capacity of researchers of the Global South. And this is through delivery of high quality training to equip members with essential skills and knowledge through standardized training materials and maintaining consistency and effectiveness across regions. Secondly, <clears throat> it's to enhance interdisciplinary collaboration between and across groups. And this is connecting individuals and organizations with complementary expertise and resources around the world and also in encouraging a diverse and collaborative environment where members can leverage each other's strengths and expertise and experiences. And lastly, establishing a pool of researchers who can provide modeling to help inform policy. And this is to provide modeling for both known and emerging pathogens during outbreaks at the regional, national, and international levels. And then to support effective strategies and management of endemic diseases to reduce this burden. Next slide, please. So what will CEPI and the Gates Foundation facilitate? And this is either directly or through our regional facilitators, such as um, ICMR, PAHO, uh, um, Africa CDC, et cetera. So firstly, we provide funding through calls for proposals for partners that can provide this um, expertise, training, and mentorship, as well as South to South and South to North fellowships and exchanges. In addition, coordination by bringing together researchers and institutions from different Global South countries, establish the network and expanding the network and organizing or facilitating regional meetings. And this is bringing together modeling partners and policymakers. 
Um, and this is important because this will also provide us the opportunity to do tabletop exercises and, and really use what, what people have learned here. And connecting global partners. And this is through matchmaking with other research institutions, international organizations, and stakeholders. They can work on projects that are pre-existing or of interest of, of these regions, and then they can work through these partnerships and collaborations. And importantly, monitoring and evaluation of the progress and impact of the network. So here we can identify gaps and roadblocks to address uh, in the future. Next slide, please. So this is a summary of the value uh, stakeholder value flow. So it's really highlighting how the network is working. So uh, up top, you see the regional facilitators. They are providing the knowledge and expertise to SERPI and the Gates Foundation of the gaps in their regions and the partners they wish to train up or, or leverage and, and, and the partnerships they want to see developed. And they will also identify um, institutions that they want to utilize for the training. And in addition, in parallel, we have EDCTP, and this is part of the EDCTP3 call, where they are going to be funding the training for epidemiologists and biostatisticians, and we'll be providing funding for a modeling component. And this is um, the target audience is the organizations in EU horizon African countries. So it's, it's, um, it's multi-pronged and multi-partner um, initiative. Next slide, please. And so I'll end with how we envision the network um, uh, ca um, carrying on here. So this is what we in, what we see happening currently, and this is global modeling expert groups and institutions. They either work in silo or collaborate with one another predominantly. Next slide, please. And we often see a training flow to the Global South partners um, because Global South partners are often seen as the data the data people. But the, the expert institutions are the ones that are doing the modeling with the data. Next slide, please. What we want to see with this initiative is an exchange, a training exchange and a partnership between organizations. And last, next slide, please. And ultimately, we want to see a network where, where partners are collaborating with one another. And it's, it's no longer a global south or global north expertise, but it's a global expertise of modelers and partnerships. So in an event of an outbreak or a pandemic, a global uh, threat, we can leverage these partnerships and uh, our regional facilitators can leverage these partnerships as well. And this can go across, span across regions as well. Next slide. And this is my last slide. So this is the potential impact of the network that we envision. This is to connect global, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, global connection and formation of new and key partnerships. This is between south to south as well as south to north. Long-term partnerships and collaborations. This is within and across regions, and we want to see this established and leveraged from a, a, as a long-term target. We would like to empower global south-based researchers and provide expertise in modeling, uh, infectious disease modeling, and related computational analysis. Skill development through training opportunities and fellowship programs. This can be developing new expertise in these areas. So there's already expertise there. We'd like to leverage it, but also development of the new, um, new, new capacity, and knowledge exchange through uh, interdisciplinary collaboration. We'd like to see the strengthening and leveraging of preparedness and response capacity and capabilities to respond effectively to outbreaks and pandemics. And last, last but not least, and not and, and not exhaustive here, informing evidence-based public health policies and decision making for local governments, but also um, national, regional, and as well as international policy. I think that's uh, that's my last slide, David. Can you just go one more? Yeah. So uh, that's that's my last slide. Thank you so much um, for your attention. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Uh Thanks, Arminder. I don't know if you can see the room, but we have standing room only in the room. So uh, uh, your talk was really well received and I think a welcome addition to um, what we're planning for the future. Um, maybe I'll take the priority and ask uh, a first question. Um, so obviously this is uh, a great vision and a very equitable vision going forward. Um, how do you think about sustainability of this network uh, you know, beyond beyond the first five or so years? Yep. Thanks, David, for that question. So if we it's important to engage with regional partners very closely because they are we want them to be the face of this network for their regions and be be the spearheads for this. And so it's going to be country and region led 
and we're hoping that we would facilitate partnerships that will continue building upon their research and the work they've done. So that what we'd like to do, we have priority pathogens in CEPI, and I don't know, for people, those of you who don't know, we have a set priority pathogens. But for this network, we're not focusing on our priority pathogens. We want to focus on the pathogens of interest of these partners in the country, because that's more relevant to them immediately. The training they'll receive for that will will uh, equip them to be able to address pandemics and any unknown pathogens as well. So this is a partnership we want to see formed with these networks. And while they're working on these diseases with their with their match made partners, they will have this relationship developed and built. And so this relationship will be leveraged for future um, projects and and even future funding. So it's two pronged. One is through regional facilitators. We want to ensure that the regional partners have a full say in this and they are the ones leading this with us and in addition the partnership is going to be forming through the advice of the uh, of the regional facilitators they'll be providing the match makes those are the match makes that are going to be key so we want to make sure the matches are very 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 um carefully selected and they're the ones who um proceed with the with the research and 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 future funding sources Great, thank you so much, and I'm so glad you kept the spaghetti diagram, even though it's complex and multicolored. I think it, it really tells a good story. Uh, so let me open the the uh, floor to questions, and please. You can just speak. Um, the mics will pick it up. Okay. <clears throat> thank you so much for a great talk. Uh, my name is Abdel, and I head the modeling unit uh, from Uganda. So I'm keen to know if uh, in your in this project you're planning to do kind of a scoping review to understand what is currently available in the global south and their needs before you can we can intervene very well and then the mm -hmm. last comment is on the is on the issue of language barrier i find that uh say in africa there are a number of languages they are saying portuguese there's french there are, do you have some plans regarding that uh, over that's a that's a very good question. So we'll be launching the call imminently. I think it's this week, if not already. And this is open for application now for global experts. And the global experts is all around the world. It can be yourselves, your, your institution as well. And it's um, the we will be relying very heavily on our regional partners, such as Africa CDC. So the scoping review is a very good idea, but it would be we actually can considered this as well, but it would be very um, intensive and labor intensive to do this, and it may be outdated by the time we publish. So we and we then therefore decided to use the region facilitators, such as Africa CDC in, in, in your case, to help identify who are the experts in this region and who are the partners that we mm -hmm. want us to work with. And so and through them, in addition to the call that's open for anyone to apply. So it, it, that's that's what we're relying on. And so if those people haven't applied to the call, Africa CDC will bring up uh, the institutions that would say would they'd say have they applied and we would reach out to them as well. And so, uh, but in terms of the language barrier, that's that's also a very good question and something that the um, again the regional partners will be the ones determining. So it will be um, the the trainers would be we'd be match made with the appropriate partners. So if it's a language. Uh, um, a French language country, we'd ensure that the French language materials can be produced for the French speaking um, recipients or the, the institutions. Um, and the call itself has been translated into multiple languages as well. So it's just emphasizing that it's going to be, the, the language barrier hopefully won't be a, too much of a big obstacle. Please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, it sounds a very good talk and it looks very promising. But my, my key question is, do you identify any um, potential barrier that you anticipate to obstruct um, meeting the objectives for this work? Good question, thank you. I think the potential barrier is the countries we want to work with and help facilitate. Some barriers are going to be very, some of the basics, like. Is there high-speed internet? Is there um, computational equipment that they can can do the modeling that we want and what they want? And so that that's something that we are working, we'd be working case by case um, to address with with our Gates partners as well. But it, that, that's one of our our main our main concerns is can they conduct this? Because I'm from the Global North. I I trained at Imperial College London, where we have high performance capacity there, and that's all, all high performance computers. It's not going to be the same, and um, and how can we address this? And there's something we'd have to do case by case. 
And the other thing is, and this is something that's moving very fast, is methodologies. And this is something where um, symposia such as this is very key. Method methods are moving forward very fast, particularly in AI. And how do we adapt it in time with that? So we want to make sure that we're not leaving leaving anyone behind and we can use this opportunity to to update our methodologies and then provide that training globally. So it's also key that we remain up to date with our training and who our partners remain up to date with training. So we'll be assessing and standardizing all the training material that's going to be proposed. Thank you. Please. Um, so you've mentioned that there was a lot of modeling done during COVID times and it primarily in north uh, northern countries. Um, but I, there's there's a question how much of that modeling was useful, how much of it was criticized, were mm -hmm. these steps made? And these people have been, people involved in this have been trained for probably a long time. So my question mm -hmm. is, how long do you think it takes to train a modeler mm -hmm. to be a good modeler? So if you envision this, yeah. model, you know, these yeah. visits, et cetera, mm -hmm. will three months or be enough? Or mm -hmm. how long should it be? And how, how yeah. do you envision long term? Uh, how can you say, yeah. okay, this particular country now has a good modeling mm -hmm. unit that, yeah. that can be trusted, let's say, or something, or they have the good expertise? So yeah, again, a very good, very good questions in these audiences. <laughs> so, so this is the very key. It depends on what level people are coming in at. So we're not teaching baseline level. People are coming in at. So we'll be teaching a data science department modeling. So they they already have a baseline level of computational look or quantitative skills it's not from scratch so that's that's already a head start but what we what we say is generally um i want to say i'm just gonna throw this out there we say three years to develop a modeler with consistent training and then but then this is not just sitting there training and learning it's actually training but also using as you train so the disease areas they work with so these are institutions that are already working in certain diseases um uh, or public health bodies that they can also apply and they'll be actively using the the, the data that they'll be uh, they're collecting on the modeling they're being trained on. So the, I, that's the, that's the idea of this whole um, the training because it's otherwise you can easily not use your your modeling training. And so and in terms of usefulness, it's it's questionable because it's also politics. There's a that that part we don't go into. So we do the modeling part, we don't do the politics part. Um, a lot of the politics don't decide that. It may be not the optimum um, approach using the mo modeling says, et cetera. So that's something we don't go into. But in terms of the training and expertise, three years is what we'd say. And this is, it's, if you're starting from scratch, that's a push. We, we're looking at people starting at a baseline level of quantitative skills. And, it, and the call is a three year long call. So you can either um, um, apply as an annual sort of course and then, um, and then actively use that um, training. Or you can do a whole three-year training, uh, propose a three-year training, and then you'll be match made with a partner, assuming that you'll be the one applying and doing the training for a, an institution. Thanks. Uh, hello, yes, this is Nita from Ginkgo Bioworks. Um, uh, I had a question related to you know, a lot of time, some of the limitations on modeling relates to data, lack of data, or lack of standardization in data. And I was wondering if, how you were thinking about that in relation to this initiative to build up the modeling. Mm -hmm. It's a good question again. So I'm, I'm going to stop saying good question because they are all really good questions. And I it would be would have been great to have you guys ask these questions before we develop the call. But actually, so the data is always an issue, especially with the priority package in CEPI works with. The, the data are sparse or not available. Um, and this is something we want to see actually applicants address and we want to see what, how they address this. If they're simulating data or they are going to be targeting partners who have data. So for example, they might do, uh, they may partner with someone who's doing malaria interventions or, and data collection. And they may want to train those partners in malaria modeling or, or more advanced malaria modeling if they already do something similar. So that's, we're hoping to address it through pre-existing data of, um, it doesn't have to be a priority pathogen, it can be any pathogen that they're working on. And there, we're, there we're assuming there, is, there are some data available. And then additionally, what the, what the applicants suggest and propose in terms of data availability. They can't just propose modeling. We want to see what they're proposing, what they're proposing to use. And it's a stronger applicant if they're showing that uh, a consideration for the data availability. Okay, um, I'm gonna 
uh, close it for now. Um, I think we have to move on to our next speaker. I would like to thank Arminder for joining for join um, for joining us from the UK. So I know it's late there, and you're of course welcome to stay on, and I hope you will. But um, but thank you for uh, for that talk. Thank you all. Thank you for attention. And, and ju just one editorial note: um, you, you did mention the um, the access to to cloud compute. Um, a different project that I'm involved in is, is actually using Starlink, uh, providing Starlink to some of our labs uh, uh, in Africa. We're doing genomic work, and obviously you need a lot of um, bandwidth to upload uh, the sequences uh, for, cloud, for cloud analysis. And so there are, um, there are efforts underway to do that, and I could see that being leveraged for modeling groups in similar settings. So hopefully we can talk about that later.